I'm Anne. I'm from Stand Out Earth. You are in the right place for the webcast on Starbucks. And um, I'm going to take everybody through just a couple logistics things and then I will introduce our speakers and we'll get uh, underway. All right. And if you will wave as your name is called, Jim Ace is the senior campaigner and actions manager at Stand Out Earth. Jim has worked on a range of social justice and environmental issues with organizations including Rainforest Action Network, Greenpeace, The Ruckus Society, SEIU, and Alliance for Democracy. He joined Stand in May 2012 to challenge the logging industry's greenwash of forest destruction. And Jim, thank you so much for being part of this today. Shiloh Britt worked as a Starbucks barista for five years, resigning in 2017. That same year, she graduated from Western Washington University's Huxley School of the Environment with a BA in Environmental Studies. Shiloh has been an avid volunteer here with Stand Out Earth and has participated in over 30 actions with the organization. Shiloh also works as an elder caregiver and welcome Shiloh and thank you for all your time getting ready for today. Emily DeFrisco is the Director of Communications for, Plastic, for the Plastic Pollution Coalition, a global alliance of more than 700 member groups working to stop plastic from polluting our environment. She has 13 years of experience in communications for nonprofit organizations, creating viral social media campaigns, Orange Gate, and Open Your Eyes with Jeff Bridges for Plastic Pollution Coalition, and on toxic chemicals and children's health for Healthy Child, Healthy World, and Environmental Working Group. And Emily, thank you so much for being here today. And Emily has warned us that a child of hers may walk past the screen. This could happen. Just want everyone to be prepared for that. We're kind of hoping it happens. Not. Um, <laughs> and don't worry if it does. Um, thank you all for your prep um, and your time and your work. And I am going to um, bring up some questions to start us off and um, give me just a moment to do that. All right, so the first question that I want to ask is how did Stan decide to reboot the Starbucks campaign? Tell us in just a couple minutes um, about the impact and what was the timing of and the reasoning behind rebooting it. And, uh, the, so Stan started out as an, a coalition, actually, about 20 years ago, of Greenpeace, Rainforest Action Network, and NRDC, and their or, the orientation was around protecting forests. And that coalition became Forest Ethics and then eventually Stan. So our, um, you know, what, what drew us to Starbucks was, was the paper cup. Uh, and Starbucks uses over 4 billion, would it be, 4 billion cups a year. That's over 8,000 cups a minute. Most of them end up in the landfill because, at least in part, of the cup's 100% polyethylene lining. It's plastic lining. Most folks aren't aware of it. I wasn't aware of it. Um, uh, and so that's really, uh, at least initially, what, what drew us to this issue in this company. Um, but as you sow, and um, there may have been others, but as you sow provided a lot of uh, a leadership on the Starbucks uh, company uh, working on the cup issue for, for many years. Um, and the, of course, the company itself was very, uh, was paying a lot of attention to the cup going way back to the 80s. Um, in 2006, the company developed a 10% post-consumer recycled fiber cup. Uh, and then in 2008, the company made some commitments around recyclability of the cup and reusable cups. And so, um, you know, we saw those commitments um, and some of its movement on cups as promising. And so we relaunched uh, the campaign or relaunched our campaign to really uh, follow up on their commitments to hold them accountable for those commitments they had made previously. Terrific. And um, just a note too, to encourage um, any of our um, panelists to um, um, to come in with um, comments or questions for each other, additional feedback as we go. All right, great. And um, tell us about the key elements of the new campaign so far. Did you start out by reaching out directly to Starbucks? If so, what happened? Yeah, I'll take that one as well. So we, we always, of course, contact, the, engage the company uh, and make uh, many efforts to engage the company before we launched a campaign. And that was certainly true with Starbucks. We sent a letter, they, we didn't get a response. So um, 
uh, we gave them an opportunity and an invitation really to, to do the right thing. Um, the other thing I'll just say in terms of what we had initially conceived the campaign as is really a story-based campaign. We wanted to tell a story with it. Uh, and so we came up with this, uh, several of our, our smart staff, staff members came up with this idea of the super mermaid. We didn't want to sort of both shame Starbucks consumers, their customers, or the company really. It wasn't sort of a boycott kind of a, a frame. So we, we wanted to keep it positive, but encouraging and inviting and propositional. So um, really inviting the company to do the right thing. So the idea of the super mermaid, this, um, this powerful female superhero um, who was going to fight back against this Starbucks, this evil Starbucks cup monster became the sort of story of the campaign. And that followed, we, have, we put out a comic book, um, which we'll, we may show you, um, uh, a, a, a actually a professionally designed comic book um, and we launched the campaign at Comic-Con, the Emerald City Comic-Con. It's the Comic-Con here in Seattle. And, uh, and we really followed that through much of the campaign. We sort of followed that, followed that story and used the story to, to, to raise awareness of the campaign. Great. And um, why don't we transition to talking a little, going into the, um, some of the details of the ground campaign. And how about if we start with a little bit of that, we have a little video from that Comic-Con launch. Yeah? Okay. Are you guys seeing and hearing that? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Good. Okay, so just a little taste of that launch. And yeah, then- I'll just jump in, and that was yeah. one of the three elements of the, the launch. Uh, also, the, earlier that morning, we had, we had gone to the Starbucks headquarters with one of the super mermaids and went up to the, the eighth floor, the executive floor where the president uh, and CEO is, and uh, delivered a petition. Um, we had also uh, taken a group of um, activists and traveled around to almost 20 stores throughout downtown Seattle that day handing out the comic book and um, uh, making a scene at a number of stores, or actually about, eight, I think, 18 stores we hit that morning. So it was a fun day. Terrific. And then um, uh, let's talk a little bit about the ground campaign and why it was important and what some of the uh, really important elements of that were. And I'm going to try to bring up some more images. Um, and I think, uh, I think Shiloh, I think you're going to take us through that. Yes, so as we were saying, the ground campaign has been all about taking the Super Mermaid and going with the storyline of Super Mermaids against this evil cup monster. And this all started in 2016 at that Comic-Con. And since then, we've just been rolling with that. We've gone as far as to create a giant cup monster that the Super Mermaid goes into battle with. And as the campaign has wore on, the cup monster has had two different remodels. Um, Stan Parker especially has been wonderful with that. And it, it takes a whole team. It's not just some organizers. It's not just, you know, Jim working on it. It's, it takes an entire behind the scenes crew to do all this. And we've done, you know, multiple different actions. Like Jim was saying, we've done multiple tours of stores as we call them, 
where we'll go in just as baristas and go to different stores handing out literature and explaining what is going in, what, what is going on. Um, one of um, the things that we've done recently has been going to the Starbucks shareholders meetings, the AGM. And the AGM last year, we got so inside the heads of the executives that one of the executives, I believe it was the VP, said that she had nightmares again about this giant cup monster that you know at the time was made of cardboard. And then in sense then some of the larger things that we have done is we did a five day vigil where we parked outside of their headquarters in downtown Seattle. It's what December and we're just there for five days with the, our 8,000 cup wall, our 12 foot call, foot tall cup and we'll we will use, um, we'll have different organizations come and help us out. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but especially the, the people of Plant for the Planet, 350 Seattle student organizations. Again, it's, it's not just one of us, it takes us all. And most recently at the Starbucks shareholders meeting uh, in 2018, we were there as well. Terrific. Anything else, um, Shiloh, is there anything you want to point out about the images um, that are coming up here or anything that we're missing? Just holler if there's one that I should bring back up. Okay. The two young women there uh, with the petition delivery, that was this, at this year's AGM in March. And uh, these are two young women from Canada. They posted a petition on the change.org platform and uh, got uh, hundreds of thousands of people signing their petition and they were uh, uh, instrumental in, in helping uh, near the end here in, in March. Uh, they actually met with the CEO, the new CEO, Kevin Johnson, and then of course uh, were involved in this petition delivery and that's what this photo is of. Awesome. And then let me, um, let, me let me pull up that uh, the comic too um, and show that. And this is Emily, I'll just add um, too with the cup monster. It was such a cool visual to have that cup monster on the ground with us in Seattle um, at the annual shareholders meeting. And for all of us who were taking video and doing Facebook Live to be able to point at that cup monster and say this cup monster was made from 8,000 you know, single use disposable Starbucks cups that are not recycled. Um, this is the amount that Starbucks goes through every minute. That was a very powerful visual, both on the ground, um, organizing in person and organizing online as well. Great, and let me ask a question too about this so that um, the cup monsters in the comic and then also there's this physical cup monster at the actions. Um, which came first? Is the comic first and then you knew that, did you always know that you were going to build a giant cup monster and what was entailed in that? Sorry, the comic came around in 2016 and we did not have a cup monster in till the AGM of March 2017. And for that first time, it took us uh, taking over a donated space by uh, Doug Tolshin, which was awesome. And a group of college students, myself, Jim, our families, it, I wanna say it took us about three weeks of very late nights, early mornings, and you know, multiple things, uh, events happen during that time that there's setbacks. But that was our first version of the cup monster and that cup monster ended up, you know, getting, he was made out of cardboard so he ended up disintegrating uh, at our last action last year in, um, at the five day vigil. So it took us about what, three or four weeks again that this, February to create another much sturdier cup monster. But then you, um, but then as Emily was bringing up, you know that the power of these, um, these pieces, these visual pieces um, in terms of the executive suite and also public support, the way the public is reacting. Any, do you have any other um, things that you want to say about that? Um, about maybe what it was like when um, 
uh, for as employees are coming to the HQ or um, people who didn't know about the campaign were walking by uh, down the sidewalk and then the cup monster is out there or the wall of cups is out there. Specifically with the cup monster um, grounds as we named him is a huge attention getter. People will walk by activists in the streets handing out pamphlets. It's very difficult to walk by, you know, a, a 10 plus foot cup monster and not at least show some interest in that. If people didn't know, we, the media especially uh, was really interested in, in these props that we had out. And it wasn't just the cup monster. We had um, people dressed as baristas to counter them. And <laughs> What was really fun is to watch people figure it out. So we took the, uh, I remember we, we took the Cut Monster on a parade uh, and we, we, were, we were going down the middle of the street with the both, both, both curves lined with people and people would look at it, they'd point and they sort of, there'd be this funny look on their face, they wouldn't understand and then, and then this aha moment would hit them and it was really fun to watch the sort of recognition and they would get it. Oh, right, they're, it's a, they're, they're talking about weight, wasteful cups, single use cups and so that was really fun. Um, I'll also say, as I, actually, as I think back, we, our initial theory was that we go to Starbucks stores, but also places where Starbucks would care about their name being, or their brand uh, being stained. So we, would, we went to uh, Starbucks-sponsored events, that sort of thing, uh, in Seattle. Um, and that, you know, we eventually sort of continued doing that, but, but broadened it and obviously hit them at the headquarters as well. But Really, it was, a, it was sort of about experimenting and trying to figure out, sort of poking them in different places and seeing where they would react. And it turns out that the cup monster is where we got a reaction. So we, we, when, we, when we figured out that we actually had something that they, they really didn't like and they didn't want to see out in the world, that's when we knew that we had, had something that, that, that worked. Okay, great. And I'm going to direct this next one at Emily, kind of getting into um, the power of the online engagement and I feel like there's really interesting interactions between the online and the offline too so I'll invite everybody to to come in about that but um but let's bring um Emily up next to talk about how you leverage how the campaign leveraged online engagement um mm -hmm. and um and anything that you want to add about um kind of the the synergy between online and offline yeah, it was a wonderful synergy between the two. We had 20 different organizations in our Starbucks coalition, we called it, um, building off the great work that, that Stan and others have done with Starbucks. And we had, you know, two great hashtags, you know, break free from plastic, which is, you know, a, an umbrella movement that many of us are, are a part of, and also hashtag um, Starbucks trash which was just really compelling for people. We asked people to photograph Starbucks trash in their neighborhood and, and share it on social media with that hashtag, which went over really well because who hasn't seen Starbucks trash in their neighborhood? It's, it's everywhere. Um, also just using the power of an online petition tool that were, was super easy to sign. You could sign it from wherever you live in, in the entire world, and that petition was delivered on the ground in Seattle. So we made it just really accessible for everyone, really easy to use, and, um, and it was very, it really, the campaign really resonated with people. And I think one of the reasons that it really resonated with people is because many people don't know, like Jim mentioned, that, you know, Starbucks straws, lids, cups are, are not recycled. The majority of them are, are ending up in the landfill or our oceans and waterways. Ocean plastic pollution and plastic pollution in general is, is this growing, growing topic of concern and a growing crisis, really. Um, so we were able to kind of, you know, use all of those things to our advantage to build this really cool digital campaign um, with our, in partnership with these other organizations. And what you're seeing here on your screen now thank you, Anne, is um, the main petition page, which as you can see, has over a million signatures, was super easy to sign, super easy to share, and, and really cool. So we were really happy that we got over a million signatures. Okay, great. And Emily, should I pull up that other graphic? Sure. Yeah, another thing that we used um, to kind of leverage the, the digital organizing is Thunderclap. Um, so we used Thunderclap and had a bunch of different organizations in our coalition and even organizations outside of the coalition 
sign on um, to kind of release the same tweet at, at one time. And that, that thunderclap, as you can see from this, um, this photograph here, this image, reached 6.4 million people, which you're really happy with. And as you can see, you can see a, a green straw um, right there in the ocean. And if that doesn't make you feel like that's a problem, I don't know what will. I mean, that's just ready to be eaten by a poor little marine animal. So we were really happy that our thunderclap reached so many people and that so many people kind of took up the call to, to sign the petition and put the pressure on Starbucks to change. Okay, great. So um, let's talk a little bit about how the coalition worked together. Um, and um, how did the coalition come together? And um, what makes it work well? So just starting off with who's in the coalition and how did the different organizations first approach each other? And this could be the yes. same or Emily to start. Just, uh, I, I tip my hat to Ross Hammond, a uh, former uh, colleague who really helped, I think, sort of get the ball rolling and, and starting to talk to uh, the plastics folks. And um, I think that started in the, the fall of last year. And um, by, by you know, January of 2018, we were in full swing planning. So that's, that's my recollection. It all, it all happened so fast. Emily, what was <laughs> Yeah, that's absolutely right. I think, you know, Stand began the work and then these 20 different organizations kind of came together. We had weekly calls and we kind of, you know, aligned our messaging, our messaging. Break Free From Plastic, again, helped with kind of our messaging alignment. Um, and yeah, we worked really well together. And it was really cool because, you know, Starbucks has a long history of ignoring, you know, one tiny nonprofit organization, right? but they can't ignore the power of 20 working together with all of our networks and all of our communities, um, you know, standing up together and demanding change. So it was really, really powerful and, and a great way to put the pressure on them. Great, and um, what has happened during the campaign that has been surprising? And I should say, I have just, a couple more questions and then we're going to open it up and we are getting um, some via Facebook Live and some via the uh, Zoom platform and please tuck your questions in there. We welcome them. Um, so just a couple more from me and then we'll get to those from the audience. So what's been surprising in the campaign okay. and how have you leveraged, leveraged it um, to benefit when possible? I'll, I'll start. One of them was something we, we, ha we couldn't have planned for, and that was uh, over in the UK, a show on BBC called War on Waste. Um, celebrity uh, named Hugh, um, his last name is, is hyphenated and always escapes me, but um, he did a, sh a great show on paper cups and talked about Starbucks and that was huge. And that led the UK Parliament to consider what they called a, or what was dubbed a latte levy, that is a fee on single use cups. And so that was, that really uh, had a, I think a significant effect, um, certainly over in Europe and in particular the UK, uh, but obviously companies over here in, in the US and including Starbucks were paying attention to that. So that was, that was huge. Uh, Emily, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I would say we just, we, we really had a coordinated effort with you know, many rungs of the ladder, if you will, um, with, with the digital you know, the online petition, um, beautiful social media posts created by Stand and Plastic Pollution Coalition and others really shareable content, um, you know, asks to turn out in person in Seattle on the ground and make your voice heard. And then another one of the groups in our organization upstream, they worked very hard on this toolkit um, where anyone in the world could use these resources to print a letter, a dear manager letter and bring it to the star a Starbucks in their community and show up in their community and demand change. Um, and I'm just looking for the numbers here. Those letters were delivered at over 40 Starbucks locations in 60 countries. No, six countries, six countries. So I think, ha and that was all the day of the AGM. So it was a very, you know, really well coordinated effort that I think really put the pressure on, on Starbucks. You're muted, Anne. 
That's my favorite trick where I forget to unmute myself. Let's, <laughs> let's talk about the win a little bit. What did Starbucks commit to? And I know we have some questions coming in about that too. What did Starbucks commit to? And when we hold them to this win, what will the impact be? And I think, um, why don't we haven't heard from Shiloh for a little bit. Let's kick that off with Shiloh. So April 2017, right after their shareholders meeting AGM, they said that they were going to double the percentage of recycled fiber, double the percentage of reusable cups, and double the, the number of communities that accepted cups for recycling. The day before the Starbucks AGM, this year, March 2018, 10, they just came out with a $10 million initiative to develop a recyclable and compostable cup. When they live up to this promise, this impact is going to be huge. It's going to be felt all around the world, not just here in the U.S., because Starbucks is the biggest coffee company, and developing a new technology will be a game changer. Everyone is, will go where Starbucks has led them. Okay, great. And, um, and Shiloh, just will you just run us through those, just run us through, because I know people are listening hard, just a couple, run back through the, what they committed to this spring. Double the percentage of recyclable fiber, double the percentage of reusable cups, double the number of communities that accept cups for recycling. And they have created a $10 million initiative to develop a recyclable and compostable cup. Okay, terrific. Um, and, and we'll come back to those in just a minute. Um, um, what are some of the key lessons learned so far from this campaign? Emily, you wanna lead off? Sure, I think we learned a lot. Um, I think we had a lot of great success and I think we learned you know, that we, our voices are stronger together. We need to work together um, to achieve these big goals. And, um, you know, that was just so beautifully demonstra demonstrated with this campaign. So we're thrilled to have been able to partner with the 20 different organizations in order to accomplish this. And we're not done. I mean, we're still gonna be, be, be holding Starbucks to their promise and more in the coming, in the coming weeks and months. Yeah, and I would say a key lesson is um, flexibility uh, or agility might be a better word for it. And that is um, being willing to uh, shift messaging and strategy uh, and, you know, it's really almost theory of change, really, because uh, shifting to the plastic pollution uh, issue and really emphasizing the, the plastic piece was, was critical. Uh, so that was a, a really big piece. Frankly, the, you know, re recyclable cups and post-consumer cycle content just wasn't landing. Uh, it just wasn't getting the, the, um, the traction that, that we needed it to. Um, the, the only other thing I would just would add in addition to that is just getting into the head of the employees was really key. We felt like by having a, a regular, persistent um, presence, both at their headquarters and stores, and just that sort of uh, regular drip uh, was, I think, had an impact leading up to this sort of crescendo at the AGM. Terrific, and um, as, as in terms of continuing to hold Starbucks feet to the fire, um, what about the commitments and these lessons learned? How is that shaping uh, the campaign going forward and what are the next steps? Yeah, I think, oh, you can go ahead, Jim. I was just going to say one, you know, um, we would love to see P Starbucks completely get rid of their not so green straws, as we call them. Um, you know, they, it's awesome that they've made this, this commitment to create this recyclable and compostable cup, which I, you know, Jim will talk about is, is going to be a challenge. Um, but we also need to get rid of that other plastic that they serve um, all the time, every minute of every day. Um, and we need them to increase their use of reusables like they committed to do. We need them to actually really put, put some, some weight behind that um, because in the long term, that's going to be what's best for the environment. Yeah, that's right. And good news that they have uh, committed in the UK to, to eliminate straws. Uh, 
the city of Vancouver just uh, banned straws uh, in Vancouver. That takes effect in uh, in 2019. So, so plastic straws. We're okay with straws. Sorry, plastic straws. Um, so, you know, I think plastic straws are on the way out. It's only a matter of time. And uh, there's some more pushing to do to get that done. And then, of course, there's uh, lots more plastic to get banned as well. Obviously, reducing, as you know, we always start with reduction uh, and reusables. And so there's, I think there's a lot of work to be done there as well. Um, and uh, Stan's focus in particular will be focused on uh, continuing to work in the sector, in the retail coffee and quick serve restaurant sector, and really emphasizing in terms of the paper cup, a reduced plastic and universally recyclable cup. And that technology exists now. And so we're gonna to continue to push uh, forward on uh, companies really starting to switching over to that, to that technology, to that product. So yeah, more work, more work to do and certainly keeping an eye on, on, uh, on Starbucks and making sure that they keep their promise. They have made promises before. Uh, and so really holding them accountable for their commitments will, will be, you know, work that we'll, we'll be doing, doing together as well. Okay, terrific. Um, so uh, we're going to transition to questions from the audience. Um, and I have um, one from Facebook Live that I'll say you say in a moment, an, an anonymous one that I'll say in a moment to kind of to kick us off. And while we do that, I'm going to try, I think we have a moment here, I think we have enough time to do this, and it's always fun to try to make it so we can see and hear um, the people who are not anonymous who submitted their question or comments, including Ross Hammond, who was invoked <laughs> just a little bit ago. I'm kind of hoping that Ross will make a video appearance here. That'd be fun. So, um, uh, so the people who I will be trying to make visible are um, Kristen and Judy and Ross. And um, while I kind of load that up, I'm going to tell you what our other questions are. So we have a Facebook Live question from Rohit. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. About um, was there a bring your own cup um, element to this campaign at Starbucks? So I'm going to give you all that one. Was there a bring your own cup campaign? And our anonymous question is, wanting to hear more about the role of, bar of baristas or former baristas like Shiloh in the campaign and if store level workers um, played an important part. So bring your own cup, role of store level workers, and I'll let you um, all start on that while I um, load these folks up. I'll take the first one. Yeah, so we launched, when Stan launched its campaign, we had three demands. One is around uh, the recycled content in the cup, two is around the re a recyclable cup, and three, and really kind of where we need to start is re reducing cup consumption. So by that, we mean people bringing in their own reusable cup. Uh, and so that is, um, you know, and, and when the Plastics Coalition uh, came together and the coalition came around together around Starbucks, that was certainly a focus too and was included in the, in the revised demand sets uh, set as well. So uh, yes, uh, it definitely was on the demands and it was a part of the campaign and Starbucks uh, addressed it by committing to double the number of beverages that are served in reusable cups. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so we'll be holding them accountable to that. It's not where we'd like it to be. Their initial commitment was 25%. Back in 20, 2008, they committed to serve 25% of their beverages in reusable cups by 2015. And then they, uh, they've reduced their commitment down to 5% and they've never gotten above two. So there's lots of room to grow there, um, but uh, getting them moving in that direction is critical. So yes, and uh, more work to do. Great. I can take the second part of that. So baristas played a huge part, Starbucks baristas and baristas in other coffee shops because they helped propel this message. They told their customers and that was a huge risk for them. But most importantly, they were on this online platform. We had um, online petitions that they signed and we went through an organization, which I don't know if I can mention, so I won't. Mm -hmm. And they, they realized there was a problem, stepped up to the challenge and then brought it to the attention of their managers, of their district managers. So the company was well aware of it. And that was a huge risk for them because you know, especially at the time when I was there, the company was very much denying what was going on and saying this, this isn't a problem, but they went out and you know, took that risk despite 
what the company was saying and I commend them hugely for that. And more than anything, they were willing to talk and to listen to what we had to say, despite what they had, what their, you know, employer had been telling them. So the Starbucks baristas and other baristas were a huge part of this. Yeah. And I'll just add, it just, it was an invaluable resource having Shiloh and others, you know, kind of tell us what's really happening in Starbucks stores and the lack of recycling of even recyclable items. Um, was quite shocking. And, and one, another great moment of the campaign was um, a film that I think a barista had taken of showing that in a Starbucks store that the recycling bin and the trash bin were actually the same bin. So that was a cool moment for, for all of our followers to say, wow, okay, they're not, they're, there's some obfuscation here. They're not being truthful. Terrific. All right, and I see some of our folks coming in to give their questions and comments. Ross, let's start with you. Um, you are muted right now, and let me see if I can. Hi. Hey, great. You had a comment, Ross, and I'd love to have you share it and and um, and get a little dialogue going on that. I did, Dad. Nice to see you all. Um, nice to see you. This is definitely one of the funner campaigns I've worked on uh, in a long time. Um, so I, I just want to highlight. I think there were th three other things that I, I might have mentioned. One. I think having um, the as you so resolution on the official agenda, um, you know, I know there's there's lots of sort of debate about whether shareholder activism is really that useful and um, maybe you should just sh sell your shares. But I think in the case of Starbucks, the fact that they that, that there was this target, the, the resolution went in in the fall, I think around it was the end of September, it was approved or it sort of Starbucks basically let it go in early January. So we knew that on the official agenda, there was going to be a discussion about recycling um, and reusability. And so the, even though the resolution itself really called for Starbucks to basically do more study and see how it could meet its commitments, that was sort of like on the official agenda, we knew we had a, a placeholder. Um, secondly, was the Denver Post article. Um, we, Jim in particular, worked very uh, long with the reporter there who really, um, you know, and again, it's not, it's not always you get these sort of in, but when you, if you're persistent, you know, I believe the occasion that you will eventually find that person, that reporter, who's willing to both listen to you and then is curious enough to start doing their own digging. And so what we got about two weeks out was a front page Denver Post article, like the Starbucks cup that you think is gonna be recyclable is actually just going into the landfill. Again, it's sort of, you know, sometimes with campaigning, you just, you have to keep repeating the same thing over and over and over. Um, and, and the Starbucks cups are not recyclable is like one of those, it's basic foundational facts for the campaign, which I think at times we sort of forgot like, oh, okay, we all know that, but like, it's the saying, right? You say, keep saying something over and over and over. And when you're finally sick of hearing it, that's when it starts to sink in with people. So I think having that, that piece was really important in terms of pushing Starbucks in those last months like that, the, the impending uh, descent upon the shareholders meeting of all these protesters, the cup monster, the delivery of the letters. Like we just sort of, we just have that date. It's really, that's also why shareholder meetings are great our great sort of organizing places. Um, and then just on the involvement of the baristas, yeah, you, it's As You So, it's a great online organization that works with workers in un, unorganized industries um, and basically allows employees to start their own petitions. And so the, the Starbucks Recyclable Cup petition got, you know, I think it got a couple of thousand uh, baristas to sign it. So again, for the company to know that this isn't just, you know, environmentalists, these are actually their own employees who really care about this. Um, and then I guess finally just, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of meetings with the staff. Um, and when we did, it, they, were, they were a little tense, but I do think that those meetings helped crystallize for, for some of those top people, the fact that we were not gonna go away and they had to tell their bosses that something something needed to be done because we weren't just gonna gonna drift away. So that's kind of what I have to contribute. 
Awesome, Russ. Um, anything that um, people want to riff on from that? Oh, and I see Tim Newman is actually on on the call <laughs> from Coworker. <laughs> Yeah, I'll just, I'm going to jump on that. Um, uh, and Tim, thank you for joining us. Um, just a couple other quick acknowledgements. Um, and I'll start with just As You So and just to make sure folks know that. So As You So wasn't a part of the coalition. As You So is doing their own thing. Uh, and, you know, it just right time, right place. And uh, glad that all lined up. So thank, big thanks to As You So for its leadership. Um, and just to clarify, those are two sort of separate uh, efforts. Um, and of course, the Starbucks Coalition that came together and, and the groups around the country and the people around the world that took action. Uh, I'll, I'll just mention Kristen Walsh from Plant for the Planet and her, her family and the Plant for the Planet crew in Seattle were amazing. 350 Seattle, uh, lots of folks from 350 Seattle participated in the actions uh, for the last couple of years. Um, students for the Sailor Sea here in Bellingham and Doug Tolton of uh, the Sailor Sea Marine Sanctuary provided space for us to build the props. Uh, Stan Parker, uh, Debbie Cantrell, uh, two activists here in Bellingham were uh, put in many, many, many hours uh, working on them. Gene Bergman, a, a friend in New York City that worked hard behind the scenes. Students for Environmental Awareness and an environmental group uh, at Rutgers University did a number of actions at Starbucks stores and around their campus. So um, Ross and Vanessa and many, many others, uh, you know, it took a lot of us um, a lot of heavy lifting from folks around the world um, to make this happen. So huge appreciation to you all for being a part of it. Great. Um, okay, we have a few more questions coming in. I wanna let Kristen, Azure, and Theo jump in. And oh no, we should be able to hear you now. Thanks for, um, thanks for joining. So my question was, um, I heard in the news, because it was like really big, that um, Starbucks did commit $10 million to try to make a recyclable and compostable cup. But like, um, do we know if we, they have made any success with that or do, or like still in the process or have they, do we know the pr uh, progress on that? Hey boys, great to see you. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> Yay. Uh, I am such a huge fan of your family. You're amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, anyway, hey guys. Uh, yeah, so sorry, the short answer is um, what we understand is that Starbucks has written a check to a group called the Closed Loop Partners that work on sort of systems level thinking and trying to solve these problems. And it's, recycling is very complicated. And so Closed Loop Partners has some uh, expertise in trying to figure out those systems and how to make them better. So we know that that step has occurred and that, and that uh, Closed Loop Partners is developing the criteria for what that cut would look like, and they, they're going to issue a uh, what's called a request for proposals, they're basically soliciting ideas from the private sector on what technology might work. And apparently they've gotten hundreds and hundreds of um, entrepreneurs, you know, companies who have said, hey, we, we, have, we have the solution. So uh, at least so far, there seems to be fairly significant interest uh, and a lot of ideas out there on what might work. And so we are cautiously optimistic that out of this $10 million initiative, that a, a new groundbreaking, game-changing technology will come out of it. And that is what, um, that's what I'm excited about. Does that answer your question? Well, we were curious about um, why we can't just give Starbucks the better cup that we were handing out to people saying, look, this already exists. And what kind of that cup have and why can't they just use that? Sure. So the the, the technology that, that um, we were handing out is a is a technology that is reduced plastic and is universally recyclable. But what it is not is compostable. And so what Starbucks has committed to do, what they've promised to develop, is a technology that is both recyclable and compostable, which is doesn't exist in the world right now. So uh, that would be great to have because consumers, you know, most of us look at a paper cup and, you know, we're not going to know whether it goes in the compost bin or the recycling bin. So having a technology that is not contamination, regardless of which bin it goes in, would be fantastic. The technology doesn't exist yet as far as we know. Uh, and so that's why we hope that, uh, well, that's why we look forward to Starbucks delivering on that promise when they deliver it. In the meantime, 
there is existing technology on the market now that is both uses less plastic and is universally recyclable. Uh, and that, again, that exists now. And so that's why we're going to Starbucks competitors, other companies in the, again, retail coffee and quick serve restaurant sector and saying, hey, look, while we wait for Starbucks to develop this unicorn horn, uh, <laughs> here's something you can do right now. Uh, and so does that answer your question? And I would just say too, you know, I have kids that are a little bit younger than you guys, um, and maybe you already do this, but we bring our own cups when we go places like Starbucks. And even though Starbucks doesn't advertise it, they do have a discount if you bring your own cup. And we need them to incentivize bringing your own cup so you can refuse single use plastic for the earth. Um, so that's just a reminder to everyone listening, um, bring your own cup whenever you can and it will make a huge difference. So um, one last question. Uh, I know the grounds kind of <laughs> got destroyed. <laughs> we were there when grounds died, um, yeah. Uh, so uh, now there's a cupzilla. Um, I was just asking like, what is the action that cupzilla is gonna participate in? Is he like, it is- What happens to cupzilla? Yeah, what happens to cupzilla? <laughs> Cupzilla is in a garage in Bellingham right now, waiting to come back out. So uh, we should we we should circle up and talk about what action uh, we're gonna do with Cupzilla. Cupzilla is at, at our disposal. <laughs> All right, awesome. I want to thank um, our first set of folks for um, for your questions, and I'm gonna um, close down the webcam so the people who've already gotten asked questions. I'm gonna bring in a couple more questions while I do that. One from Judy who. Uh, uh, has a question but didn't want to come on screen and Judy's question is how does having a recyclable cup actually work as China stops accepting our recycling so how is the global recycling uh, crisis affecting all of this yeah no great question and you know for, certainly for West Coast cities uh, the the shifts in the and the, the threat and trade war that Trump has instigated with China it has huge implications for cities uh, along the West Coast especially. Um, but that's why we're so focused on uh, developing, you know, getting companies to switch over to a, a cup that's universally recyclable. Uh, now, we, we would definitely start with, look, it's all about reusables and reducing consumption. So we have to start there. But to the extent that we're gonna have paper cups in the world, they should be recyclable. Um, and so, really the issue now is because of that 100% polyethylene plastic lining, it makes the cups harder to recycle and therefore less valuable. The paper, the paper mills don't want them because they clog their filters and so there's really no market for them. So the idea is we have to change the economics of recycling, make it more profitable uh, and incentivize the private sector to invest in recycling those, that, what, could, what is otherwise a valuable commodity. So our theory of change is, if we can change the cup lining, how the cup is made, what it's lined with, so that the cups is more valuable to recycle, that will change the economics and change the system. And I would just add that, you know, that's great points, Jim. I think that, you know, we need to hold Starbucks, even though they came out with this commitment and it's a big win, we need to hold them accountable, like we've said before, to actually increasing reusables, because that will make the difference. You know, we hold Starbucks, to blame for our global to-go culture. You know, nobody really expected that you get your coffee to go before Starbucks really pioneered that. So we hold them accountable for all the Starbucks trash and we need them to really, in addition to everything else they're doing, promote reusable cups in their stores. And I'd like to add to that. I, it's worth noting that Starbucks in the last couple months has come out with a reusable $3 iced venti cup where before they just had the you know $2 reusable hot cup and now they have an iced one so I'd like to think we had an, uh, an impact on that decision. All right we have three more questions I think they're all anonymous and I'm gonna run them uh, down and, and I'm also gonna bring up contact information um, for the campaign um, as our speakers answer. So um, uh, one of them is to talk a little bit about what is involved in the implementation um, that is necessary. What's, um, what's, uh, what's happening there in terms of um, 
uh, monitoring what's happening with the Starbucks process and, um, and also the different commitments um, for different amounts of um, percentages that they're uh, promising. And um, there's also a question, or well, maybe there are just two. Was your campaign involved in the Starbucks experiment in charging for to-go cups in London? Is this something that you're going to push for them to do more? So um, were, was, were these folks, were you all involved in that work um, in London? And, and then also what are the implement, implementation steps going forward? Uh, so yeah, so the so tr Starbucks uh, volunteers. So at, at around the time that the UK Parliament, a committee in the UK Parliament was considering the latte levy, that's when, and this is a pretty uh, consistent pattern that we've seen, right? As soon as government starts to step up to take action, the companies involved and the sector involved will say, "Oh no, you don't have to pass legislation. We'll take care of it voluntarily." And that's exactly what happened um, in the UK. So when the UK Parliament was starting to talk about a latte levy. Starbucks said, oh, you don't have to pass a law. We'll voluntarily start charging for single use cups. And so that's what they've been doing. And the, the promising thing there is that they've seen a, I think it was a, I haven't looked at in a minute. I think it was 150% um, increase in the number of reusables. So uh, the takeaway there, the lesson is, and that's what we've been saying from the beginning is, it's really charging people a fee. I mean, giving people a reward for bringing their own cup is great and a positive incentive is fantastic, but it's really a negative incentive that really helps motivate people like me, um, uh, along with a customer prompt at the point of purchase. So what we understand is that it's a fee combined with asking people, what kind of cup would you like? Makes people um, really uh, think twice and motivate them to bring their own mug. So, uh, that's, uh, that's the direction that we need to go in as far as that goes. And it seems to be uh, you know, moving in the right direction in the UK, we, but we, we have our work uh, cut out for us here in the US. That's really, we, we need that to start happening here in the US. In order, and Starbucks needs to do it in order to meet their goal, their new goal of 5%, um, they're gonna have to start doing that uh, here in North America. And in China where they're growing by leaps and bounds. Mm -hmm. And anyone else want to weigh in on that? And who else would like to talk a little bit more about implementation? Emily, you want to lead off on the plastic side? Pardon? Would you like to lead off on the plastic side and next steps there? Yeah, so next steps with plastics and Starbucks. Yeah, I mean, as we've mentioned, we're just going to keep the pressure on. Um, we need to see Starbucks really commit to reducing the amount of single-use plastic they use. Um, you know, our oceans are at a tipping point, which is, you know, some language that we used in the campaign a lot. Um, if you've read any of the recent statistics on ocean plastic pollution or plastic pollution in general in our landfills and our waterways, um, it's just incredibly sobering. And um, you know, we each of us needs to do what we can do to to limit our use of plastic and refuse single use plastic, and also just demand better. So we're going to be demanding that Starbucks, um, you know, stop serving so much single use plastic. The straws are you know cleaned up on beaches and waterways. Um, you know, they they are ingested by marine life. They're really incredibly harmful. And eventually, even if they're not ingested by marine life, they will. Um, break apart into toxic little particles called microplastics. So we will be we will be in continued conversation with Starbucks, asking them to, um, you know, stop using so much single-use plastic and polluting the planet. Yeah, and from the stand side, we launched our campaign with three demands, and Starbucks has addressed all three of them with these commitments that don't go far enough. But um, so I think in terms of our work with particularly with Starbucks is to hold them accountable for, for those commitments, uh, starting with reduction uh, and including, you know, we're, we're looking forward to their uh, doubling the amount of recycled fiber in their paper cups. And we're certainly looking forward to their initiative on the recyclable and compostable cup. So, um, you know, just continued engagement with the company and can continue to build uh, pressure um, to hold them accountable for their promises. 
absolutely. And if you're listening to this webinar and you signed the petition and you showed up, you know, on the ground, you showed up at a Starbucks near you, thank you so much for joining us in this awesome campaign. And if you're listening and you're from Starbucks, you should be afraid. <laughs> Right on. Um, uh, so just note on the screen, um, info if you've got a question for Jim or Shiloh, you can send it to Jim Ace at Stand Earth and keep watching what's going on at um, the bettercup.earth website. For Emily, um, Emily at plasticpollutioncoalition.org and the website is plasticpollutioncoalition.org. Plastic um, stay involved. Um, I want to thank our presenters, Jim, Shiloh, and Emily so much um, for your time today and all of your work on this. I also want to thank some folks behind the scenes, Trista, Hallie, Kirsten, and Ginny for helping make all of this happen today. And um, everyone who requested the recording, you will get uh, emailed uh, the link to a copy of it, and we hope you'll share it with other people who are interested. And thanks again, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming.